This is Curious Minnesota, a Star Tribune project that sends staff from the state's largest newsroom hunting for the answers to great questions we receive from you, our readers. We're here to answer everything you want to know about the state's people, places, and culture. Welcome to Curious Minnesota. I'm your host, Eric Roper. We're taking it up a notch on the podcast today, going on location to Minnesota's largest drinking water treatment plant. We're going to break down how Minneapolis makes Mississippi River water safe to drink. The city's waterworks treats more than 50 million gallons of water a day, serving not only Minneapolis residents, but those of several neighboring suburbs. How do they do it? Well, we'll find out from George Cranick, the water quality manager for Minneapolis's water system, who took us on a tour of the campus. But first, let's hear from Doug Dewey, who asked us this great question about a hidden system that many of us, including myself, take for granted. So I had watched and read and listened to the Curious Minnesota on where our wastewater goes in the Twin Cities. And at the end of that, it got me thinking about the river, I mean, because obviously the water ends up there. And I've always been pretty fascinated with how drinking water gets to us. And I know that Minneapolis gets its drinking water for the most part from the Mississippi. How do they clean it? The river's pretty clean nowadays, I think, compared to what it used to be, but it's not something I would dip a cup in and drink. To see Minneapolis's water treatment process, we actually have to head north of the city to the suburb of Fridley, where most of the action happens. The city moved its operations here more than a century ago in response to its downtown pumps spreading disease. Originally when we started, all of our pump stations were down in Minneapolis itself, but they realized very quickly that we were bringing river water and delivering it to the customers, but all the industrial waste, all the sewage was going right back into the river, and we were repumping that and giving that water to our customers. So within a matter of 10, 15 years, they decided to locate everything north of the city. So our two water plants are located in the Fridley and in Columbia Heights. The first thing you notice after arriving is the architecture, much of it dating back to the construction of the campus in the 1920s. The buildings are a cream-colored brick. Skylights and vintage metal sconces help illuminate many of the large interior spaces. Some doorways feature decorative tile patterns, and several rooms are domed by a metal truss system. Not everything at the plant is so ornate, but there are spots there that make you feel like you're in an old European train station. We're standing in front of this building. There's these beautiful sconces, all this wrought iron decorative hardware all over the doors. I mean, this is not some afterthought of a public building, clearly. No, they actually took pride in their work. And you can even just look at the brickwork up around the windows and how they have the different colors of brick. We started our tour at Pump Station 5, the primary pump for the entire system. Pump Station 5 both pulls water in from the river and later sends it out to homes. Both Minneapolis and St. Paul get their water from the river, which is unlike most suburbs, which pull groundwater from subterranean aquifers. We began on a little balcony overlooking the Mississippi River. There are holes about five feet above the bottom of the river that are about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And what those holes do is they let the water in, but they keep the sand and silt from coming into our intake chambers. And if you look down, you can see there are bar screens, there are metal slats. They keep all the big stuff out. We see everything, mannequin heads, footballs, two liter bottles. We don't want any of that stuff coming into our building. So those bar screens keep all the big stuff out, let the water pass through, and then it goes through a different set of screens before we pump it to the softening plant. Inside is a large room with two rows of beefy cylindrical motors that have been pumping Minneapolis's water for roughly a century. Those motors that you're looking at are the original motors from 1925, and the pumps you're looking at are the original. We haven't replaced them because they're, they're very efficient and they work great. I'm only seeing one that looks like it's on. Are they all on? No, so right now you're only gonna see maybe two pumps on. So we have what we call multiple redundancies. So we could easily lose half of the pumps you're looking at and still provide the maximum amount of water to the city of Minneapolis. Pump 24 that's on right now, there's probably about 500 gallons per second going through that pump. You can't imagine fitting that much water in there, but it's really moving a lot of water very quickly. Around the corner in the distance, I spotted what I thought was a brass clock. Is that a clock or a flow meter? So that is actually the pressure gauge. So the clock is above it, and then it's a giant brass dial which measures the pressure. So right now the pressure is about 102 or 104 PSI, and that's what we like to maintain going out into the system. Next, we entered the softening plant, 
If you live in Minneapolis or St. Paul, which has a similar operation, this is why you don't need a water softener in your home. Here, the plant adds several chemicals to extract unwanted materials from the water. Lime, for example, is added to pull out the calcium and magnesium left in the water from limestone that's common to our area's geology. The lime also removes some of the harmful material in the water along with it. Aluminum sulfate removes the dissolved organic material that gives river water its tea-like color and powder-activated carbon helps remove taste and odor from the water. Once the chemicals are added, the water flows to large tanks called softening cones. There are 12 of them all together in this giant room, illuminated largely by natural light from skylights and windows. This is like a massive room, largest room we've been in, in so right. far. Up until this point, the water's been moving really fast through our whole facility, from pump station five to where we added the chemicals. Now we want to put on the brakes. We want everything to slow down, allow gravity to pull all the particles out of the water. And, and there's lots of cones in here. Yeah, so we have 12 of them. Each one holds about 660,000 gallons of water. So under a normal production day, when the water first enters the cone to when it leaves, it's going to take about four hours. And it looks like the water over there is kind of, it's got a greenish tint to it or something. Yeah, so when you put the water in a container like this, it'll actually take on a color. If you take a scoop of that water out, it'll look crystal clear. And you might notice this phenomenon at home and you fill up your bathtub, the water won't look crystal clear. But if you look in your toilet, it is clear. And while many chemicals are added in this process, we're not drinking them. The three things that we add here, none of them leave this building. Everything settles out here. 90% of the stuff we're trying to get out of the river is removed right here. So the alum, the powder activated carbon, and the lime, they all precipitate out here. The water with reduced hardness, no color, um, and actually some bacteria and viruses will actually get removed from the process. That's the water that goes to the two filter plants. We followed the water to another facility on the other end of campus, known as Fridley Filter, where bacteria and viruses are screened out. We walked there in an underground tunnel that Kranich says was likely once used to transport coal back and forth between the buildings. This is one of several tunnels under the campus. So now we're going to the filter plant and we're, wa we're actually walking down what looks like an enormous corrugated pipe that is probably seven or eight feet in diameter. After roughly four minutes of walking, we arrived at the Fridley filter plant. The water is much cleaner now than it was in the river, but still not absolutely safe to drink. There's still bacteria in the water. There's still viruses or things like Giardia, protozoan cysts. A lot of those are going to get filtered out here. And then whatever doesn't get filtered out, the chlorine and ammonia will combine to basically kill any live bacteria or viruses, especially the pathogenic viruses that are still left in the water. Remember that architecture I referenced earlier? Here's where you really see it in full view. The main filter room is literally shining. The filters surround a grand central hallway featuring glossy floors, cream brick columns, skylights, and metal trusses. So there's basically these concrete kind of cutouts and then underneath there's water and what's under, what are we looking at that's underneath that? Because that's doing a lot of important work, right? Yeah, so what we're looking at, and it's kind of hard to see, but there's actually 22 inches of granular activated carbon and about 12 inches of sand. And gravity is pulling the water down through that carbon and through the sand. And what's happening is any particles that are left are being pulled out and settling out on the carbon and the sand. Any taste and odors that are in the water are being absorbed onto the carbon. And even though it's just sand, that sand is actually incredibly efficient at removing particles from the water. Once the water goes through these filters, then we'll disinfect it and kill the viruses and bacteria. But this is basically the last step where we can see the water. Once it passes through here, we don't have access to it except for sample pumps. And this filter is treating roughly about 2 million gallons of water per day or roughly about 1,200 gallons per minute. So even though it doesn't look like there's much going on, there's a large amount of water that gravity's pulling down through this filter and we're filtering out all the particles in it. Okay, we're almost done, but now is actually the most important step, disinfection. The plant adds chloramine to the water, which is a more stable relative of chlorine, to kill any remaining viruses and bacteria. This chemical is toxic to humans, so treatment plants add it after the water is largely cleaned, when only a relatively small and safe dose is needed to attack the remaining viruses and bacteria. The introduction of chlorine to water systems in the early 1900s coincided with huge drops in typhoid fever, a waterborne illness. Before we started adding chlorine, you know, a couple hundred people every year were documented and dying specifically from that. We know there were way more, but once we started chlorinating the water in 1910, 
that rate dropped off and pretty much disappeared. It's also at this step that the plant adds fluoride, which has nothing to do with water safety, but is required in Minnesota and in other states to improve dental health. All right, that's it. The water is safe and ready to be pumped to your house at a constant 100 PSI. It travels a network of distribution pipes spanning more than 1,000 miles altogether. In case you were wondering, treating river water is far more difficult than treating groundwater. A lot of people who are living in suburban areas may get the water from groundwater. Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the neighboring communities that they serve are kind of unique for getting it from the river, right? Right, yeah. So we have this giant river, the Mississippi River, that runs through the whole state. And and there's only three water plants on that. And out of the 900 plus water treatment plants in Minnesota, only 10% get their water from the surface. The rest of them get it from groundwater sources. We have to deal with the rainfall events, the spring runoff. So it is definitely more, more challenging. Groundwater typically doesn't have the organic material in it that the river does. That's what gives the river that brown color is all the dissolved organic material, which is very difficult to get out of the water. Our tour wouldn't be complete without noting two other details. One is that the city actually has two filter plants. At the second one, located in Columbia Heights, water is forced through thousands of hollow fibers to remove tiny impurities. This process is known as ultrafiltration. The second detail is that the city uses freshwater mussels to detect changes in the Mississippi River. These creatures, which look good enough to eat, spend their days bathing in untreated river water at the softening plant. You can see they have sensors attached to them and the sensors measure how far they're open and closed. So this is like an early warning system? Correct, yeah. So it's, For what? Uh, in case there's a spill in the river. I mean, this is a pilot program to be sure. Um, the goal is to, to catch that monitoring immediately and then you know we have at least a three-day supply of water. We can shut down our intake or we can up our treatment to remove whatever is in the water. So it's really just if say uh, a tractor trailer falls off and goes into the river or there's a railroad derailment and the rail cars dump chemicals into the water. This would give us an early detection of that. Because they would close up? As soon as something's in there, they'll close up and they're going to stay closed until that contamination has gone. And the benefit these guys have over like say a piece of equipment is that they run 24-7. If we were trying to analyze the river for volatile organic chemicals, things like carbon tetrachloride, you could only run a sample at best every hour and then there would be a lot of maintenance on the machine. These guys are basically maintenance free. We clean the tank out basically once a week and you know they're just in there chilling out happy as clams there you have it folks i learned a lot from this episode and i hope you did too i will link to a photo gallery of our tour in the show notes as well as my story on this topic that ran in the star tribune last fall i'm sorry the podcast has been a little bit more sporadic than usual lately i produce these on my own when i'm not working on other stories and this episode in particular took some time to edit i'd love to do more of these on location episodes in the future though so if you have an idea for one shoot us a note at curious at star and if you enjoyed this episode Episode, please pass it along and recommend it to others. I would really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Curious Minnesota. We want to hear from you. Ask questions and read more stories online at startribune.com backslash curious. Our show is recorded at the Star Tribune's headquarters in beautiful downtown Minneapolis. And our music is produced by Matt Gilmer. If you like the show, please rate us on iTunes or leave a review. And until next time, stay curious.